lifted up and highly exalted. Just as there were many who were appalled at him, his appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any man, and his form marred beyond human likeness, so will he sprinkle many nations. And kings will shut their mouths because of him. For what they were not told, they will see. And what they have not heard, they will understand. You can change your oil. You can change a diaper. And every January 1st, people promise to make a change. In fact, Dan Marino and Marie Osmond have been promoting the positive physical changes in their bodies thanks to Nutrisystem. We live in a world of changes. The problem, however, is... Quite often, the changes we make, they don't stick, do they? Change the oil, and yes, the odometer clicks forward another 3,000 miles. You change a diaper, and lo and behold, 50 minutes later, there's another blowout. Uh, you can change your diet, but there's always a temptation to slip up. And even if you make permanent healthy changes and stick them with them all the way through your life, inevitably you're going to get old and infirm, and eventually we all, unless the Lord returns, we will die. No amount of dieting can change that. We need more than just an outward change. We need an inner transformation. And thankfully, that is exactly what the prophet Isaiah is telling that God has provided for us. He's proclaiming the transformation that is ours by Christ. And so tonight, as we begin this Lenten season, we're going to jump into this little section of Isaiah's prophecy, and we look at how God promises to be faithful to this change, this transformation. And here, Isaiah is speaking on behalf of the Lord. He's speaking on God's behalf, and he's saying, the, the Lord's saying through Isaiah, See to us, see my, my servant will prosper. My servant will act wisely. And so who's God's servant here? This is the Lord's servant. This is none other than a promise of the Christ, Jesus of Nazareth, the Son of God. And he's promising that he will accomplish the work he was sent to do. And now we've seen that fully in Jesus Christ. Yes, he has come to fulfill the will of God and the law of God flawlessly in our place, his perfect life. Yes, he has come to take the burden of sin off my shoulders and upon himself, and he did that on our behalf. Yes, he has come and done that. How do I know he's done that? Is it just his life and his death? I hate to spoil the rest of Lent for you, but no. And so on Ash Wednesday... As we begin the 40 days of preparation unto what's going to happen next, we cannot forget Easter. It's always before our eyes. Even on Ash Wednesday, we have to focus on the transformation that was accomplished at that empty tomb. Because you see, there, if Christ had not fully paid the price and done the work, he would not have been raised. And that's the transformation truth. Another thing we can look at, how about those disciples? Look at the transformative power in their lives, a divine renovation that occurred. Cowards transformed into the bravest of men, laying their life on the line, willing to give it up for their Lord and Savior, and a true inner change. You see, that's a transformation. It's something that takes place on the inside and has its reflective reality on the outside. Something that takes place inner and is revealed on the outer. And so like a butterfly in a cocoon, the Holy Spirit transformed those first disciples. And the quiet, inner work of that shy one of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, he is still transforming, turning fear to faith, from timidity to boldness. He's turning 
stony hearts in the hearts of flesh, brimming and pulsating with the love of God, speechless throats into lips filled with a message, and cowards to heroes. True transformation. The work of the Holy Spirit, his job is to reveal what Christ has accomplished. And you know what? That happens whenever the gospel is proclaimed. Wherever the gospel is proclaimed, the Holy Spirit is working this transformation in hearts and lives. But you know what that means? That means the gospel has to be proclaimed. And that is exactly what Isaiah is doing. He's preaching the gospel here. And he says prophetically, the servant of the Lord, oh, he will act wisely. He will prosper. He will be greatly exalted and lifted on high. And in my mind, I say yes. And I picture that exalted, ascended Jesus. And Paul who says that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. But it's Ash Wednesday, not Easter Sunday. And so how can Isaiah say that God's servant will act wisely and prosper and be lifted up and exalted on Ash Wednesday? To be lifted up, I have to go here to the cross. And when Jesus was lifted up on that cross for all to see, he was exalted. And that was to God's glory? We just sang about it. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, look at the transformation Jesus endured for you and me, humbling himself and becoming obedient unto death, even death on a cross, as Paul marveled. And I think of our old Lenten hymns in our old red hymnal. I hear of Paul Gerhard and Martin Franzman and Martin Luther. I think of him 113 that puts it this way Upon the cross extended, see world your Lord suspended. Your Savior yields his breath. The Prince of Life from heaven himself has freely given to shame and blows and bitter death. A transformation unto humiliation. And that's to the glory of God. And so when Isaiah speaks prophetically about this servant of the Lord, he describes him as someone who is beaten and marred and transformed beyond recognition. And that's where the cross and passion of our Lord come in. And it's ours through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit revealed in the Word. And I don't know exactly how the inspiration of the Holy Spirit worked All I know is that I believe that what the Word says is true, that that the prophets, they received exactly the words and the thoughts that God wanted them to write down and convey. And so did Isaiah have this image of this beaten, bloodied, tortured, torn to ribbons man on a cross who is tortured beyond the typical victim of a crucifixion, all because he's bearing our sins transformation the prince of glory now is the one who is despised and gory and I'm reminded of another Lenten hymn transformation oh sacred head now wounded with grief and shame weighed down now scornfully surrounded with thorns your only crown O oh, sacred head, no glory now from your face does shine. Yet though despised and gory, I joy to call it mine. What, what wondrous love is this, that the King of Heaven 
would come down and humble himself to save us in humility and not in visible glory. He came living amongst a people whose sins offended him, and yet he's merciful. He bore their insults, and worse, he bore their torture for their sakes. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they're doing. And this was unlike any other thought or imagination that any human brain could have concocted about the divine passion play. This was never in the wheelhouse of any other human-made deity because we're not talking about a retribution and a punitive ogre who says, do this and don't do that, or a schmaltz and a love based on just feeling and emotion. We're talking about the intellect, the compassion, the purpose and will the desire of the Lord Almighty to rescue his creation. And so he becomes marred beyond recognition, transformed so that he might reveal himself to us. And because of what Jesus did and how he did it, Isaiah says he sprinkled the nations. He sprinkled the nations with blood. Yeah, that blood that was once the agony has now become what cleanses us. It washes us. And, and where do we find that washing? It's in the gospel. The Bible preached and taught. It's in the washing of holy baptism. The word with the water tying that child to Jesus' work on the cross, his empty tomb. The Lord's Supper in, with, and under the bread and wine. We receive the body and blood of Jesus to eat and drink for the forgiveness of sins. An extraordinary communion. Receiving what was sacrificed, yet in a way that strengthens us. Forgives us. For as often as you eat the bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Transformed by Christ. Inside and out. And that's the beauty of God's love. We can't comprehend it. We can't expect it. We can't understand or grasp it by logic or reason. Because it is illogical and it is irrational. And yet the truth is, as Isaiah said, from every nation under heaven, people have been sprinkled. They have been cleansed, and they've been saved through the salvation in Jesus Christ. Shut my mouth. I didn't expect that. Not in this way. And Isaiah as much admits that, and he says, kings will shut their mouths on account of him. For what had not been told them heard they will understand do you see how the gospel works here this is the mystery that paul says was hidden for ages past but now has been revealed in these last days you know even the jews who had the scriptures and even the prophets who are recording it didn't fully comprehend and understand the picture and put all the puzzle pieces together until god finally was ready to reveal it and even the angels look down from heaven and they wonder what an amazing thing our Lord has done for this crown of his creation. The gospel is so utterly unique, only has the power to transform hearts and lives. And you know what? That really applies to today's world more than ever, I think. You know, we live in a day where we are media-saturated, Tomorrow evening, we'll be beginning the first in a series of a few workshops, we're going to look at what in the world? What is your Christian viewpoint of the world and beyond in relation to everybody else's viewpoint of those things? And there are different viewpoints. With social media, cable TV, smartphones and apps and not, we've convinced ourselves that we've pretty much seen everything and anything imaginable whether we believe it to be true or not. There's nothing that surprises us anymore, is there? Take commercial ads, for example. 
you know, America is still talking, maybe you are, what's your least favorite and most favorite Super Bowl ad? You see how we rely so heavily on computer-generated effects to sell ordinary products. I mean, I don't know exactly what a puppy monkey baby is, but I saw one Sunday night. I still don't know what a puppy monkey baby is. But apparently someone thought that that was absolutely necessary to sell a soft drink. We have come to be a nation that doesn't know true from false, real from virtual reality anymore. And in the midst of this relativistic, pop culture-driven, virtual reality-saturated culture, there stands Christ alone. And it's still through the ordinary that he accomplishes the extraordinary. We, on the other hand, need the extraordinary to sell the ordinary. <laughs> We've seen it all, I guess. We need special effects to sell a soda. The Lord does the opposite, doesn't he? He uses the everyday to reveal the eternal. He uses human hearts and voices to proclaim his word of truth. He uses sinful and chooses sinful, weak hearts to be his throne. And he uses everyday lives to accomplish his divine purpose. You see, that's the difference between Christianity and all other human philosophy and religion. Humanity thinks that it can be good enough, it can do enough, and be smart enough to make the right choices to save itself. And whether that's a religious thought or a secular thought, that's really what we think about ourselves. You know, that seems to make sense. That's a virtual reality dream, though. Sounds good, but it's completely false. It's like those commercials needing special effects. It seems to be offering you so much more out of the ordinary, but behind the scenes, they're just offering the same everyday, ordinary, average bill of goods. And it's the same lie that Satan fed Adam and Eve. You can be like God, knowing the difference between good and evil. And so to save us from that confusion and that fatal confusion, God does the opposite. The extraordinary became ordinary, like us in every way, but without sin and then suffering in our place as our 100% absolute perfect substitute to take sin away and to remove the need for my obedience. That's gone. I'm not a, one who is a child in God's eyes because I am earning it. No, it's because of Jesus' righteousness and his faithfulness in my place. That's the reality. And then Jesus took it one step further, and he rose. Yeah. No one else has been able to do that one throughout history. No David Copperfield, Houdini, or Chris Angel could accomplish that feat. No, none of those sleight-of-hand virtual reality masters. No, only Christ can do that, and that means only Christ can save. And you see, those who take him at his word and trust him to do what he promises are blessed. Good news in life, great news in death, transformation by Christ. You see, we're no longer under the law. We're under grace. No longer under a curse. We're under blessing. No longer labeled and defined sinner. You are saints. And now as the saints of God, we have the privilege to serve this living Lord with our lives. And we have the privilege to thank and praise him with decent lives. Talk about transformation. His glory shining through the everyday deeds of this cracked pot? Yeah, transformation by Christ. And it's not about changing the behavior. It's about transforming the heart. For when the heart is transformed by Christ, the mind, the mouth, the hands, and the feet will follow. Transformed by Christ. When I think about it, David Bowie was sort of right. Talk about changes. He said, ch, ch changes 
Turn and face the strange. Turn and face the strange. That's what the Holy Spirit has done for us. He's led us to turn and face the strange message of the gospel. Turned us towards a message that the rest of the world calls foolishness. And it is a peculiar message, the message of the gospel. Through the cross, God shows his glory. Through the death of his son, the father saves his wayward children. That seems an odd, foolish message. But we who believe, that's the transformative power and wisdom of God. That the Prince of Glory, he became despised and gory so that we might be glorified. Transformation. Thank the Holy Spirit. He's led you to believe in the strange beauty of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Not being forced to change the outside, but transformed inside first transformed by Christ. Amen. And one of those ways the Lord has led us to be transformed is to take simple things, use them in extraordinary ways. That applies to our lives, our gifts, our talents, and our offerings that we collect at this time.